Hello, everyone. This is Jill. Have you ever wondered if you could be one of the most insightful human beings in literature and think like Sherlock Holmes? That's what we'll talk about today. To a great mind, nothing is little. Sherlock Holmes, written by Arthur Conan Doyle. Today, we're going to talk about the book, Think Like Sherlock. Creatively solve problems, think with clarity, make insightful observations and deductions, and develop quick and accurate instincts by Peter Hollins. This first episode of the podcast is going to talk about how we can solve problems like Sherlock Holmes and think about things outside the box. And then next week, we'll talk about the second part of the book where we can try to be more observational and use deductive thinking to help us make better decisions. Thinking like Sherlock is enticing. We always admire in every version of Sherlock Holmes, the man who thinks about everything, the man who sees everything. And the question is, could we be more like him? Obviously, we can't be him because he is a fictional character. But are there characteristics and observations that we could take on that would make us more like him? If you've had the opportunity to see the newest Sherlock Holmes, which is the BBC production, it's fantastic. And the author of this book thinks that with some of the things that he noticed about the Sherlock Holmes character, we can become more like him. The book starts out with some basic observations about the intellect of Sherlock Holmes. He's a master code breaker. He knows a lot about people. He has a photographic memory and he is amazingly observational. We try to be more observational in our lives, but I think that our lives are not set up in such a way we can be. Those types of observational abilities and knowledge, we never set down to actually attain. If we were to walk around and think about things as long as he did, people would worry about us. We cannot spend time in the Sherlock Holmes mind palace. He does bring up that we do at times spend focused details. Maybe it's a parent looking over their children. Or maybe it's a chef watching something cooking that she's afraid she's going to burn. Whenever you see a sports figure, you can see them concentrating on the next play they're supposed to make. But it doesn't happen all the time like it does for Sherlock Holmes. So part of the reason that we don't think like Sherlock Holmes is because we choose not to. If we had to do that all the time, we'd be exhausted. Instead, we limit and budget our focus in such a way so that we have it when it really matters. We don't have it and we can relax a little bit when we think we have something under control, when we seem to understand what's going to happen next. So he said the way that we can break out of this thinking where we don't have to think inside the box or our normal way is what he says is the scamper method by Bob Eberly to spark creative thinking. And the scamper method stands for substitute, combine, adapt, minimize slash magnify, E for eliminate and R for reverse. These techniques will help us think about things in a new way. He says, too, we can use this type of problem solving when we have too many things to think about, multiple materials. Maybe we have to look at things with too much different kinds of focus because it's a complex problem. This will help us in those types of problems as well. For the first item, this is substitute. And that means that you're going to take one of the particular aspects of the problem or the process and replace it with something else. This might help us get into a better frame of thinking. Somehow replacing the problem at hand will help you think about it in a more logical way. Example of the combine, which is the C and scamper, is can you take something and take two of the problems that you're having and put the solution into a single device? His example is the spork. What if I needed to give you a fork for some of the meals I provide to you and other meals I need to give you a spoon? I don't have the time to deal with which thing I'm going to give you. So I'll give you a spork. It is a combination of the two. That if you do a lot of journaling and you have to have one of these to-do list planner systems that you like to use, maybe you can combine that into one book so you're not carrying two books around. What can you do to combine problems together so they're less problematic? A stands for adapt. And this just means, can you change something in some small way to adapt it to make it better? And he gives some examples, but I think of it in terms of camping. I like to bring a lot of stuff with me when I'm camping in case I run into some problem I can't solve. 
could I do this with one of those Swiss Army knives? It has a lot of different tools on it. And then I don't have to bring as many tools or as many items along because I have something that actually does many things and it adapts the problem into a single solution. The M stands for magnify or minimize. And this means that you're either going to make something bigger, stronger, or smaller. That might also be my Swiss Army knife solution. Maybe I can bring a lot of things camping with me if I made them all tinier things. It all fit more in my camping solution or in my luggage solution when I travel for work. The P stands for put to another use. And that means that you take something and you allow it to be good for something else. Maybe it's that when I go camping, I bring a cup that's good enough to put hot liquids in, but also a solid choice if I'm drinking cold liquids. Can instead of bringing two cups, can I have one cup that solves both problems and has a different use? And then the last, of course, is eliminate. Is there something that we can drop out of the process that we can remove from the system so it's not making it more complicated than it needs to be? For example, in this podcast, I had dedicated show notes. They were word for word transcripts of what I talked about during the podcast. It was very time consuming and I couldn't go on towards my other work in podcasts if I was doing this much detailed work on one particular item. I also wondered, too, if anyone had time to read the detailed show notes of my podcast. And I had a listener out there suggest to me that it would be better if I had a summary there so they could just refer back to what I was talking about and not have to read a whole document. So something that I could eliminate was better for the listener, was better for me, and so it made the process better. It solved the problem of how can I get more time to do more podcasts. The next idea he talks about when it comes to thinking about things outside the box is called the CPS method, creative problem solving, also known as the osborne Parnes model. And this came out of a creative education foundation. And the model looks like this. One, mess finding. I like mess finding. Two, fact finding. Three, problem solving. And four, ideas finding. Five, solution finding. And then the sixth, action finding or acceptance finding. He says that the first three steps are what we normally don't do when we're looking at problems, primarily because we're staring at the problem and we're already focusing on all the mess and all the shortcomings and we realize that it is a problem for us. So he said that the first three steps, in essence, are useful to us if we want to improve a situation before it becomes a mess, before we wonder, is this going to go awry? How can we find out ahead of time, or what they call a pre-mortem, so that we can try to figure out what's going to go wrong? So the first is mess finding. Think of it as you have a problem where water is spilling all over the place. Your mess there's water everywhere. There's water all over the floor. That's mess finding. Two, fact finding. Oh, it's coming from the sink that is directly over the giant puddle. And then three, problem finding. I look under the cabinet and I see that something put a hole through one of my pipes. There's the problem. There's a hole in my pipe. And that's pretty easy to do. We're very good at figuring out those things. My example was very easy but certainly some other things are going to be harder to do. If you're looking at it in terms of some kind of a product support team and the customers are unsatisfied because it takes forever to talk to the people helping customers, you can see the mess. The mess is that customers are waiting too long on the phone to talk to someone to get help. Fact finding. The problem is that our last release of the software made things so complicated that that's why they're calling in so frequently. And then problem finding is the fact that our customers are struggling with the last release of our software. Therefore, they're calling our customer hotline, talking to our customer agents with more technical issues that are harder to solve. And therefore, we have a mess. We figured out our problems. In that last problem finding step, there might be some hidden things that are there that are causing the problem. Perhaps we didn't train our customers properly. Maybe it was supposed to work exactly as it's working, and somehow our documentation didn't quite answer the questions that people were going to have. My examples were easy, but sometimes, particularly that third step, problem finding, that can be more time-consuming and take a lot more detail. 
But now we're into the other side. Four is idea finding. What are some things that we could do to immediately solve the problem? Maybe someone could create a tip sheet and send that out to our customers explaining in better detail how this functionality works and do it quickly so that they stop having to call in and be frustrated with the amount of time they wait to talk to one of our agents. And he says that while we're going through that first step of trying to figure out, to finding out what the solutions are, he says, leave no stone unturned because any judgment made without complete information is going to be a bad solution. It's going to be something that's incorrect. So if we didn't do the first three steps well, we're going to have problems making a correct assessment of the fourth step which is the beginning of solving the problem. He says that the ideas finding is brainstorming. It's coming up with as many ideas as we can think of. And we're trying to solve the problem by really thinking about everything we could do to cause this to be better. Could we call all of our customers with our training team involved and have them educated on how this new functionality works so they're happy with it and they understand it? There's a lot of solutions we could come with in order to make this problem better. He says at this point, we're going to do divergent thinking, which is trying to think of as many creative and out of the box ideas that we can think of. What can we do to solve this problem? Then we go into convergent thinking. With convergent thinking, we're actually now starting to restrict our ideas. We're trying to find the best ideas, the most practical things, and we go for the most logical process. Well, we've come to the conclusion that the training issue was really at hand. We didn't document or educate people as well as we could have on this product. So now in convergent thinking, we start thinking, we'll send out a tip sheet and we can offer a webinar that would show people exactly how it worked. And we would offer it many times a day so that it can help people use the software successfully. And that's where the solution finding comes in. We're going to converge on a solution. We're going to take all those diverse ideas, all those thinking outside of the box and coming up with a solution that converges on solving our problems, has the fewest amount of weaknesses available and actually makes the problem better. A lot of things that we could have done when it came to our bad software decision. We could have retracted the software feature entirely, just pulled back the release. That'd be awful. Our customers would be angry. We could have called them all and try to explain what this new feature did. That's going to be very time consuming for us. And maybe some of our customers got it. Maybe they don't want to call. So now we're going in with the solution that has the least amount of downside and all the positive upsides of helping our customers. He says that we're looking for sustainability, usefulness, feasibility, cost effectiveness. So now we have that solution in hand with the fewest amount of problems and the most amount of wins, we're able to go through and start putting action to our problems. And that is called the action finding step. We have to consider all the ins and outs. We have to figure out how we're actually going to make this happen and come up with a detailed plan with what he says are foreseeable obstacles, long-term milestones, and specific short-term actions. Once we do this, then we can implement the plan. So we decided that we're going to write a tip sheet, we're going to create some webinars and invite our customer, and we will also record the webinar so they can look at it at any time. That's a very good list of some short-term goals. We can come up with a plan and a script to do those things. But the real question is, in order to solve the problem, we have to also make sure that we have a detailed plan in place to make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen in the future. Can we eliminate this kind of issue when we do release new features and be more proactive. That's the action finding step of this process. Our fun entertainment advice of the week comes from, of course, Sherlock Holmes in the wonderful BBC adaptation. You're a drama queen. Now there is a man in there about to die. The game is on. Solve it. See, the problem with being Sherlock Holmes is that when as soon as you have a problem, everyone expects you to just solve it. Just solve this. Okay. All right, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. I appreciate it. If you have any questions or topics you'd like me to cover, you can email me at jill at smallstepspod.com. I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. I have my email. Whatever way you like to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to you. And maybe if you have a problem that you're looking to solve, 
I could use my Sherlock Holmes brain for you. Have a great week.